So we're going to start now the next session, which is going to talk about, uh, we're just going to be focused on Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 26. And uh, last time we were going through Galatians, we didn't have enough time to cover all that's involved there because there's so much material. I mean, there is an enormous amount of material in Galatians chapter 5. And so I decided to break Galatians chapter 5 into two different sessions. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 5, and we'll look at verse 16. And in this section of Scripture, Paul is going to lay out for us the difference between the flesh and the spirit. And it is, it, you know, there's, there's, it's so powerful what Paul is communicating to us. And so we'll start here with verse 16, and I want to I want to read it here. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now, if you remember just a few verses earlier, Paul said, don't, you know, even though you are no longer under the burden of the law, don't give your flesh an opportunity. Now, at that point, Paul hasn't really defined, okay, what is the flesh and what exactly did he mean by the flesh? And in fact, in terms of the, in terms of the uh, Paul talking about the flesh, he talks about the flesh repeatedly in his, in his epistles. But here in the book of Galatians, he introduces the flesh for the first time. Or, or I mean, not necessarily in chapter 5, but in the book of Galatians, he introduces the flesh for the first time. And so we want to ask the question, okay, Paul, what do you exactly mean by the flesh? Because if we're going to have victory over the flesh, we've got to know what the flesh is, right? I mean, if we don't even know what the flesh is, if we don't even know what Paul's talking about, then we're not going to be able to have victory over the flesh. And so we want to ask the question, what does the flesh mean? And, and to answer that question, we can... I'm just going to, just for the sake of time, talk about 1 Thessalonians 5.23, which 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says that we are comprised of spirit, soul, and body. And, and if you've been in the church long enough, you probably realize this, that you have a spirit, you have a soul, you have a body. Some scholars refer to this as the tripart nature of humanity, the tripart nature that we have, spirit, soul, and body. And so when you, your spirit just, and a lot of people don't understand their spirit because you can't see your spirit, you can't really feel your spirit. With your body, you can feel, you can feel it when you touch something, touch something hot and you know you have a body. You can look in the mirror and say, I've got a body. A soul, you know you've got a soul because you think and you feel and you have emotions and things like that. But your spirit, you don't really, you can't really uh, discern it. You can't really understand it. It's so deep down inside of you that it takes God's word to illuminate to you, you have a spirit. And so our spirit, especially if we're born again, is where God dwells. God dwells in your spirit. God dwells in that deep part of you where you commune in fellowship with him. You commune in fellowship spirit to spirit. Your spirit operates by intuition. Your spirit operates by that deep inward knowing about certain things. See, when we begin to live by the Spirit, which Paul exhorts us to here in Galatians, when we begin to live by the Spirit, we begin to function by intuition. You, you probably, if you're born again, have, know what I'm talking about, where intuitively you know something. You know something is about to happen. You know something isn't right in this situation. You know something isn't right with this person. Something triggers you deep inside of your spirit. That is the spirit's function, the way the spirit works, intuition. And uh, Watchman Nee talks about this in The Spiritual Man, the three functions of the spirit, intuition, communion, and conscience. And so... All those three factors in our spirit work together to allow us to communicate with God. And if you're born again, your spirit is righteous. Your spirit is holy. Your spirit is complete. Your spirit is one with the spirit of God. In your spirit, you are a partaker of the divine nature. And your, your spirit is the dwelling place of God on the earth. Your spirit is that. It's a powerful reality. Now, your soul is, you know, when you're born again, your soul was not affected by the born again experience. 
Your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, was unaffected initially when you were born again, but for the rest of your life, your soul is going to go through a process called sanctification, where God is conforming your mind, your will, and your emotions into the image of Jesus Christ. And of course, you know about your body, and we're probably more than any other part of us we're, we're, uh, are familiar with our body. We know what we look like. We know we have five senses, taste, touch, smell, sight, and hearing. And we know this is how we interact with the physical world, is with our body. Our body has cravings. We want to eat. We want to sleep. Just If you want to find out the functions of your body, just look at your animal. Look at your dog. You know, my dog, Zeke. All he seems like he wants to do is eat and sleep and poop and pee. I mean, that's kind of like what the cravings of the body work, is that's the way the body is. And so now Paul comes and he says, he calls it the flesh. Okay, well, does the flesh mean the body, or does the flesh mean the soul? And I believe when you, when, and we'll look at this in a few minutes, is when you look at the deeds of the flesh, what you will find out is the deeds of the flesh describe the coupling together of the body and the soul. And so you can look at that and say, okay, when Paul is talking about the flesh, the deeds of the flesh, he means... The body and the soul coupled together, working together, and, and we're going to get into this in a minute, warring against God. Your mind, your will, and emotions coupled together with the five senses of your body, communicating with the physical world, is at war with God. Because God the Holy Spirit has desires, and your flesh also has desires, and the two are in conflict. See, the greatest form of spiritual warfare is not always against demons, it's against your flesh. Because demons can only be successful if our flesh is living. If we are allowing our flesh to live and have its way and get what it wants and do what it wants and, you know, I want this, I want it now, I want it like this, I want it done that way, whatever it would be. If we're allowing our flesh to rule, then that, that gives the devil access to us. But if we're, not allow, if we're crucifying the, our flesh, the devil has no place in us. And so that's the war going on. There is a battle raging inside of you, a war going on between the flesh and the spirit. And that's what Paul is hitting at. So the flesh is the coupling together of the body and the soul. And um, Paul talks about it, and uh, we looked at it, or we're going to look at it here later. But he says, if we live by the spirit, let us also walk by the spirit. In other words, Paul's saying this, you are alive by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God came inside of you. The Spirit of God raised your spirit to life. The Spirit of God, your spirit was dead. The Spirit of God breathed inside of you and brought new life into your spirit. He made your spirit righteous. He made your spirit holy. He made your spirit complete. He raised up your spirit from the dead. Now you have the life of Jesus Christ living on the inside of you. You have divine life. You are a partaker of the divine nature, but even so, you still have a choice. Are you going to walk by the spirit that is in you, or are you going to walk by the flesh? And, and Paul says, I say, walk by the spirit. In other words, you have the spirit of God, yield to him. You have the spirit of God, surrender to him. You have the spirit of God in you, fellowship with him, commune with him. Don't leave him suppressed in you. Don't leave him, uh, you know, imprisoned within you. Release him. Let him live. Let him be God. Let him be Lord. Let him direct everything you do. And he says, if that, if you do that, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Here's one thing that's going to help you a lot when you talk about the flesh and the spirit is your flesh is going to have wicked, evil, sinful, depraved, God displeasing desires, antichrist desires until the day you die. The desires of the flesh never go away, but they are weakened as we walk by the spirit of God. So, you know, you, all of a sudden a thought comes out of nowhere and you're like, God, where did that come from? Well, it could have come from the devil, but it also could have come from your flesh. 
The flesh is utterly depraved. The flesh uh, that is still in Adam, that, that edemic nature of Adam is wicked. That, that edemic nature is depraved. Jesus said that the flesh profits nothing. God's only solution, the only thing Almighty God could do with the flesh was to crucify it. Your only way to victory over the flesh is to crucify it. Because the flesh still has desires. The flesh still has cravings that never go away. Verse 17. For the flesh, and this is Paul building on this again, for the, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. See, the flesh has desires, and the spirit has desires. These are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things you please. See, are you wondering, okay, why do I struggle with this so often? Well, you know, let's just take jealousy. Social media has made jealousy spring up almost in everyone's heart. You look at your friend's Facebook account or Instagram account and you see, okay, man, they are so blessed. Then you realize, okay, I'm not nearly as blessed as them. They got more favor. They got more. They look like they're having more fun. You know, their family seems more blessed, whatever. And all of a sudden, envy and jealousy rises up within us, and you're like, where is this coming from? It's coming from your flesh. Your eyes are looking at that, and they're, you're looking at their life, and your mind, your soul, is doing a comparison of what you have compared to what they have, and then all of a sudden, this envy, this jealousy rises up, and you're like, where is that coming from? It's coming from your flesh. And until the only remedy for that jealousy is for the cross to work, to put that to death so that the Spirit of God can live, the Spirit of God can rule, the Spirit of God can have lordship absolutely and entirely within you to bring down that desire of the flesh. He goes and he says, so that you may not do the things you please. So we've got to understand that in the flesh dwells no good thing. In the flesh dwells no good thing. In your unredeemed body and in your unrenewed soul, there is nothing that pleases God about that. Nothing that pleases God. What pleases God is Jesus Christ. What pleases God is His Son. And what pleases God about you is His Son in you, His Son in your spirit. And so the flesh cannot please God. The flesh is in opposition to God. The flesh is antichrist in nature. The flesh is the enemy of God. And so, you know, we're struggling and we're trying to figure out what's going on, and Paul's like, your flesh will never allow you to do the things that you please. You know, Jesus said, the flesh profits nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. See, the sooner we realize that, the sooner we realize my flesh, and I'm not talking about getting into condemnation. I'm not talking about getting into this woe is me, I'm terrible, I'm no good. I'm not talking about that. But understanding, okay, my flesh is wicked. My flesh is depraved. Therefore, I am not going to live in the flesh, which I, because if I do, I'm never going to please God. I will be at war with God. Therefore, what I am going to do is I'm going to live by that part of me that has been made new by the Spirit of God. That part of me that is righteous. That part of me that is Christ-like. That part of me that is holy. That part of me that has been made complete. That part of me, that one-third part of me in my spirit that is a partaker of the divine nature, I'm going to live from that part of me. And, and, and understanding the nature and the depravity of the flesh empowers us to do that. Here's what he goes on to say in verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Oh, this is beautiful. If you're led by the Spirit, it's, it's a synonym for walk by the Spirit. If you are yielding yourself to the Holy Spirit in you, and you are leading and following His leadership, 
Paul says, you are not under the law. Wow. Incredibly powerful statement right there. Kind of goes to Romans chapter 6, verse 15, when Paul says, you are not under law, but you are under grace. Romans 8, 4, those who are led by the Spirit of God, they will keep the requirement of the law. See, the requirement, the standard is God's moral standard, and His righteous standard. That never goes away. Even though you've died to the law, and even though you're not under the law, uh, even though the law is no longer your child trainer to lead you to Jesus Christ, the, the standard of the law and what God expects and how he defines righteousness and how he defines sin and all of that is still going to remain forever and ever. That is God's righteous standard. And so Paul's saying, if you are led by the Spirit of God, if the Spirit of God is living instead of you, if the Spirit of God is empowering and quickening you instead of your flesh, then you will keep the requirement of the law, God's holy standard. And you are not under the law. Now, Paul goes through and he's going to list for us, okay? He's going to list for us the deeds of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, and remember, again, Paul said, Paul said in, in, uh, in earlier, in, I think in chapter, earlier in chapter 5, he says, you are no longer under the law. That yoke of slavery has been broken. You have liberty and freedom from the law. However, don't allow this be, to become an opportunity for your flesh. Well, what exactly is the flesh? He's going to tell us right here. He says in verse 19, the deeds of the flesh... And we'll say it like this. The deeds of the body coupled together with the soul are evident. They are immorality. They are impurity. They are sensuality, adultery, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying. I just talked about envying, jealousy, same thing. Uh, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you. So in other words, when he was with the Galatians, he warned them about this. And now in writing to them a few years later, he's warning again that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what I want to do is talk about how the body and the soul work together and the activity of the flesh to lead to sin. 1 Peter 2.11, Peter talks about and he says, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Fleshly lust, bodily lust, the body and the soul waging war. Now when we already know the flesh coupled together with the, the body or the, the soul coupled together with the body wages war against the spirit, but the body, the, the external cravings in the body, which Paul says our body is dead because of sin, and the law of sin and death is at work in our body. And so the cravings of our body are craving things that are against God's law, against what God says this is sin. Those things are warring against our soul, to trap us, to lead us in to sin. And so we're going to, if you have your notes, you can look at it. But we, I'm just going to take a couple examples. One of the fleshly deeds Paul listed was immorality. So let's just imagine for a minute that, that a particular person struggles with pornography. So be it a man or a woman, whatever, they struggle with pornography. How does the body and the soul wage war against each other, coupled together, working together, the dynamics of the flesh? How does that happen? Well, the body has, in the body, there are physical sexual desires that God gave us. God gave us physical sexual desires that, that need to be met in the context of marriage as defined by God. Now, those sexual desires then are then moving in, you know, when, when something, see, where our eyes see something, our eyes are stimulated by something, you know, pornography, whatever it would be, then the, the soul, the mind begins to plot and reason, how can I fulfill that desire? How can I, you know, how can I satisfy the lust of my eyes or the lust in my body? 
The emotions then get aroused, and the will then makes a decision to act. You see, the, the body with its desires, the bodily desires, wages war against the soul. The soul, the mind, the will, and emotions also, with their passions and desires, work with the body. And now then the body, being moved by the mind, the will, and the emotions, takes an action because the soul has made a determination. And the person goes and looks at pornography. Another example would be jealousy. And we kind of hit on that a second ago, but I'll just review it again in this context. The body, the eyes are looking on Instagram, and you see a post from someone else, and they are blessed. You know, they're blessed with a great family. They're blessed because they're in a, Europ a European vacation before COVID-19. They're blessed, and they're, you know, they're, their whole family's, you know, in Ireland or whatever, wherever. Then, and you're like, gosh, they're so blessed. They're eating, posting these pictures of great coffee and great food with all their family and you could just tell them and they are just having the best time ever and you're sitting here and working in a cube and you know back home and you're going gosh my life just stinks my life is I don't have any of these blessings so your mind begins to say analytically say okay they're blessed because of this 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 and that and they say okay your mind says but you don't have this this and that your emotions start feeling sad and depressed, like, man, they have more blessings than I do. They're happier than me. And the will says, okay, I'm going to do something to vindicate you. And a lot of times what happens is the body will then, through the mouth, will take action to begin to judge or criticize that person, that family or whatever, and judge them and say, ah, they're just full of the love of money. They're just full of... All they ever want to do is go travel around. They're just full of this and full of that. They don't love God like I do. And, and what, what's happening is the voice of the, the mouth is speaking out the jealousy that's in the heart. See, what's happening right now is the flesh is working. The flesh is in operation. Um, you know, and you could do that with every single other deed of the flesh, outburst of anger or idolatry or whatever it would be. There's so many listed there, drunkenness, whatever. It's the soul and the body coupled together, working in tandem to each other to lead into sin and to lead away from the Lord. The next question here, and this is a big question, and I'm going to just tell you up front, I'm going to be able to devote just a couple minutes to it, but it is a big theological question, and the question is this. Paul said that those who engage in these types of sins, habitually, meaning that these sins have become their lifestyle, Paul says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean, they will not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, some people say they will not have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Meaning that they will not have the full inheritance. In other words, because they lived a lifestyle of sin, they are not going to share in all of the rewards of the kingdom of God that are listed in Revelation 2 and 3, for example. Ruling and reigning with Jesus, sitting on the throne, uh, having the rod of iron, having a crown of life, all those things. They will be saved, but yet through fire, but they will lose all of their rewards of the judgment seat of Christ. So that's, that's one view that looks at that. The other view says, well, I think it means they will not actually inherit the kingdom of God. So meaning they are not going to go to heaven when they die. They are not inheriting it now. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God for eternity. And so again, this is a, if you know the once saved versus always saved debate um, and all that, you know this is a very controversial touchy subject, and I just for this, I'm not trying to avoid it because I, I'm going to share just real quick what I believe. But, you know, there, there's a lot of different scriptures on both sides of the debate you have to consider to really answer this uh, properly. But my view, what I believe Paul was saying here was the second view is those who practice these types of sins habitually as a lifestyle without remorse, without repentance, if they practice those things that over and over and over, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not go to heaven when they die. Now, I know that's a, a big statement there, 
But it really comes down to, do we believe in the doctrine of once saved, always saved? Here's where I stand on that. I do not believe, after a thorough study of Scripture, I do not believe in once saved, always saved. However, I believe strongly in the eternal security of the believer. And you, and you might say, well, that sounds like it's the same thing. That sounds like you're saying the same thing. No, it's really not. What I mean by that is I don't believe you once saved, always saved is biblical in my opinion, but I do believe the eternal security is, is this, is we can be 100% confident that we are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. We do not have to have any doubt whatsoever. Am I justified? Am I righteous? Am I going to heaven? Does God love me? We don't have, so many people are tormented by those fears, this fear of dying and going to hell and God doesn't want any of his children living that tormented, fear-based thing where just always worried, if I make one mistake, I'm dying and going to hell. That's what I mean by the eternal security of the believer is that we can be 100% confident that we are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. We can be 100% confident that we are the righteousness of God in him, that Jesus has brought us into his kingdom and we have been born of the spirit. And so... But that does not give us a license to sin. That does not mean, okay, now that I'm born of the Spirit, I can live however I want. No, that is not at all what it means. We should always maintain the holy fear of God. We should be confident, eternally secure that we have been justified, we're righteous, we're going to heaven. He has imputed the righteousness of God to us without any hesitation or doubt. But we still live in the fear of God saying we do not want to displease Him. We do not want to get entangled into sin. See, I believe it's possible that, that a person, and you know, it talks about this in, in Hebrews, that a person can get so entangled in what is called the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is incredibly deceitful. Sin will harden you. Sin will harden you to the point that it is possible, in my opinion, where through deception and through hardness, you can deny Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, where you can deny that He is the Son of God. And, and we're seeing this right now as a matter of fact of people. I'm thinking of a few recent uh, deconversions or whatever. They, you know, they've written books. They've pastored churches. They've led worship. They've done all these things, and they've come out recently and said, I no longer believe Jesus is the Son of God. Well, uh, probably if you really look deep into what's going on, there's probably... Underlying, underlying the surface is sin working to deceive them, sin working to harden them, leading them to a place where their heart becomes hard to the Lord, and they deny the deity of Jesus Christ, and they deny the authority of God's Word, and they renounce Christianity. I, I believe that's what Paul is really leading towards, is that, that sin can harden us to such a place that we don't inherit the kingdom of God. Well, that sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? It absolutely does. It sounds frightening. But again, that does not mean God wants us to live walking on eggshells, tiptoeing like, okay, am I in, am I out? God wants us to be eternally secure, confident and righteous, but living in the fear of God, knowing the deception of sin, knowing the, hard, the, the way sin can harden us. See, the problem with deception is you don't know you're deceived. See, the problem with hardness is you don't know you're hard. And so God would spare us from all of that. And that's why Paul's warning, I warn you, Galatians. I warn you again, Galatians, that if you practice these things habitually, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Now, I am positive there's going to be questions about that. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into that more, but, but I would encourage you just to do some research on your own. And just to summarize, if you're born again, be confident that you are justified and righteous in the sight of God without any hesitation or doubt. You are going to go to heaven. Be confident in that. However, at the same time, also be fearful of sinning against God. Be fearful of walking in the flesh. Be fearful. I don't mean living in fear, but living in a holy fear of God, which, by the way, is so absent in the church today. Living in a holy fear of God that I don't want to do anything to displease Him. I think that's the balance that Paul's getting at.
Okay, we're going to move on from that. Bearing fruit for God, Galatians 5, 22 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, you'll remember back in Galatians, hopefully you'll remember in Galatians 2.19, Paul said you died to the law. When you were crucified with Jesus Christ, when you were baptized into his body, you died with Christ. You died to the law. You died to the external commandments saying, I'm going to be right with God if I do this. I'm going to be not right with God if I don't do this. I'm going to be right with God. I'm going to be blessed if I obey. I'm going to be cursed if I disobey. You are no longer under the law because you died to the law. You died to the law. Now, this is what Paul says in Romans 7, 4. He says, my brethren, you were made to die to the law through the body of Jesus Christ so that you may be joined to another, to, to him who was raised from the dead, so that you might bear fruit for God. It's really, I think you could really summarize the whole book of Galatians, especially chapter 5 by Romans 7, 4 is number one is we have died to the law. We have died to the law. We are no longer under that system of the law. Number two is we have been joined to Christ. Your spirit is now joined to Christ. Your spirit is now glued to Christ. Your, your spirit is now one spirit with the spirit of God. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one. They are one spirit. Your spirit is connected to him so that you now are joined to him. Just as a husband and a wife are joined together, you have been joined and united by the Holy Spirit and your human spirit to Jesus Christ. That is a, a, an incredible truth. It brings us to point number three, is now you can bear fruit for God. Well, what does that fruit look like? Paul tells us right here in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, or faith is the, the better translation, gentleness, or meekness, which is the better translation, or, and self-control. Notice carefully that Paul said, the fruit of the Spirit is. He did not say the fruits of the Spirit are. I want you to think about this for a second. Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, it's so interesting, and I got it laid out in the notes if you want to look at it further, but if you compare 1 Corinthians 13 and the fruit of the Spirit, it's pretty phenomenal, where Paul defines what love is. Now, I'm not talking about human love. We're talking about God's love. When Paul defines God's love, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, love is patient. Well, what's the fruit of the Spirit? Patience. He says, love is kind. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Kindness. Love does not brag, is not arrogant, and does not seek its own. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Meekness or humility. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Faith. The faith of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 13, love rejoices with the truth and is not jealous. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Joy. Love is not provoked and does not take into account a wrong suffered. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Peace and self-control. Love does not act unbecomingly. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Goodness. See, it's beautiful. What, what, Paul, what, what Paul is getting at here is the fruit of the Spirit is love, and that love is expressed by patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and faith and joy and peace and self-control. See, what Paul's getting at here is that, and we've seen already in 5.6 and 5.13 and 5.14 that faith works through love, that we're to serve one another by love. We're to, the whole law is fulfilled by love. And see, the love of God that we're talking about is the love of the Holy Spirit poured out upon your heart, and that love of God poured out upon your heart then produces the other attributes like joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control 
That then empowers you to serve one another in love. That empowers you to love your neighbor as yourself. That empowers you to fulfill and keep every commandment that the law commands, not only externally but internally, because love is the fulfillment of the law. It's important, too, to realize no amount of human effort can ever produce God's love. Human love is a terrible substitute for God's love. And we're seeing this today in our culture where we're saying, if we, you need to tolerate this and you need to tolerate that and you need to be more empathetic about this. And, you know, all that human love has nothing to do with God's love, nothing to do with God's love. God's love cannot be produced by human means. God's love cannot be uh, produced by human effort. God's love can only be the byproduct of union with the Spirit. There is no substitute for it. Human, human imitation can never produce love. Human replication can never produce God's love. It is just like that the vine connected to the, the branch connected to the vine, the fruit that it produces, it doesn't struggle, it doesn't strive to produce a tomato or a grape or whatever the fruit would be. It just is connected. It's connected. And through that vital life connection with Jesus Christ, his life flows out of us and love is produced. It's the whole John 15 lifestyle of abiding in the vine. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. The abiding life that, Je that uh, Jesus talked about, Paul gives clarity of the kind of fruit that is produced when the life of God, we're abiding in that life, and that life organically flows out of us. That life organically, naturally flows out of us. We don't have to strive to try to produce love. We don't have to strive to try to produce joy. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's living in intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Now we get to uh, verse 24, and there's, there's a lot more in the notes. I'm just going fairly quick here, but you can go more in the notes and check it out for yourself, a lot more detail. Uh, Galatians 5, 24 through 26, Paul said, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now you remember Galatians 2, 20, the crucifixion Paul was describing there was something that happened to him. I have been crucified with Jesus Christ. That was, he was describing his legal position. When, I, when Christ died on the cross and I am in him by the Spirit, I died with him. In other words, that's his legal position. It's something that happened to Paul. Here in Galatians 5.24, this is something that Paul himself does. And all believers, really, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. It's not just God who does it. It's not just something that happens to us. It is the act we take in union with the Holy Spirit to nail down the passions and the desires of the flesh to the cross. And you know it as much as I do today. The cross is painfully absent in today's gospel preaching, especially in America. Hardly do you hear the message anymore, take up your cross and follow me, deny yourself. Yet it's the heartbeat of the gospel. It's the cornerstone of the gospel. We cannot progress in Jesus if we are not taking up our cross daily. Now what Paul does is he takes what Jesus said, take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me. He takes this to its logical conclusion to say not only do you need to take up your cross, not only do you need to do it daily, but you need to crucify and kill your flesh. Your flesh, the cravings of your body, your soul, your mind, your will and emotions, what they want, how they think, how they feel. Those two attributes need to go to the cross and die, never to rise again. And that needs to happen daily if we're going to walk in victory. Well, I'm just struggling, and I just have, you know, I'm struggling with this, and I'm struggling with that, and I'm, you know, I'm struggling with jealousy, or I'm struggling with pornography, or I'm struggling with outbursts of anger. Well, your problem is not just the devil. The problem is you have not actively, daily, experientially put your flesh to death. 
I'm just going to tell you your problem right there is you are still living. And if you still live, you are naturally going to do exactly the deeds of the flesh. It is the Spirit of God helping you crucify your flesh, bringing it to its utter death so that we now are crucified with Him. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh. That's the expectation, by the way, when you come to the Lord, is this simple or this uh, American gospel that says, just make a decision, live how you want, and you're going to go to heaven. That is not the gospel. The gospel is... If you belong to Jesus Christ, you must crucify your flesh. It's not an option. It's not a mandate. It's not a good idea. It is the gospel 101. You're born again. Well, you need to crucify your flesh daily, experientially. Verse 25. If we live by the Spirit... Let us also walk by the Spirit. Now, living by the Spirit, what he means by that is you have been made alive by the Spirit. Your spirit was dead, and now your spirit has been made alive. Your spirit was dead in sin, dark by sin, darkened by the flesh, dark and dead, hopeless without any hope. But God came, and He came inside of you, and He saved you, and He raised your spirit up from the dead. Now your spirit has been made alive. You, your spirit is alive because of righteousness, and now that your spirit is alive because of righteousness, you now possess the life of God. That's what it means to live. That's what it means by live by the Spirit. But He says, now let us also walk by the Spirit. Walking by the Spirit in the Greek, what that means in the Greek, is this is an important thing to get here. Walking in the Spirit means walking in a line, a straight line. There's order. There's discipline. It's kind of like the narrow path that leads to life. You know, that narrow path, you, you, can only, you can't just walk this way or that way. You've got to walk narrowly down the path to life. That's really what Paul's saying here, that narrow path to life, walking orderly, walking in line, is how you uh, are to respond to the leading of the Spirit. Now, it's also interesting here that that leading of the Spirit is in relation to one another. So get the picture is, is, you know, just think of it as an army walking and marching in line, stride by stride as the army of God under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. See, because the Christian life was never been, meant to be you and Jesus alone. It's never meant to be you and Jesus in your prayer closet without any regard to the body of Christ, without any regard to the ecclesia of God. Everything, our destiny is tied to one another. We are the body of Jesus Christ. We individually and then corporately are meant to walk down that fine, narrow path that leads to life, which is obedience to the Holy Spirit and His leadership, His promptings. Paul says, if you have the life of God, live by the life of God. If you have and you possess the life of God, yield to the life of God. Surrender to the life of God. Let Him have you. Let Him possess you. No longer live by your flesh. Crucify it. Nail it to the cross. Let it go all the way to death. And don't just do it one time. Do it daily. Now he says, in verse 26, is don't become boastful. Don't challenge one another. Don't envy one another. See, what he's getting at here is he's getting at body life. He's getting it at how we relate to one another. And the natural thing is, and he's going to hit on it in another chapter, the natural thing Paul's getting at here is, okay, you're now alive. You're now living by the Spirit. The, the, the natural thing is, is we should then be concerned not just with ourselves, but with one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul says, but beware. Don't become boastful. Don't become conceited. Don't become vainglorious. Don't become proud. And he says, then he goes on to say, don't challenge one another or envy one another. Is when you're walking in pride, when you're walking in that self-focus, when the cross has not worked in your self-life, and you're still living rather than Christ, the natural tendency is for you to challenge one another. 
for you to be competitive with, with one another, for you to say, I can do it better than you. I can walk righteously better than you. I can obey better than you. I can do this better than you. I can sing better than you. I can, whatever it would be. This natural competition. Well, that, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, if we don't do good in that competition, we then envy one another. Well, they can do it better than me. I'm no good. I'm not blessed like they are, creating jealousy. And Paul's like, that is not the way you're to live in the body of Christ. You're to live joined together. You're to live joined together as one body marching in rank under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So we'll go ahead and we'll end here, Galatians chapter 5, and then we'll get ready for Galatians chapter 6.